So now we're extremely lucky to have Alexander Kiesa, who is a professor at Berkeley, and Alexander actually is a student of Sylvia's at MIT. Uh, and now he's um, uh, Professor Berkeley, that fantastic stuff. He's going to tell us about five SIM blockchains, actually, correct? Yep. And uh, he's also the, one of the founders of Zcash and Stark, is that correct? Right? Starkware. Software, sorry. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm extremely thankful to uh, Sandra for all his help with uh, this uh, ZK Day and for being willing to give us a talk about privacy and blockchain. Right. Thank, you, thank you so much, Shafi. And uh, uh, thank you for all of you to be here on a Saturday morning to hear about uh, um, what I have to say today. So, <clears throat> yeah, so as Shafi mentioned, I will uh, tell you about uh, uh, privacy and blockchains. And specifically, I want to tell you about how a specific cryptographic construct, uh, zero-knowledge proofs, are uh, useful to achieve privacy uh, in blockchains. So in order to um, sort of motivate, so I would like to first motivate the problem and then explain why there is a, a anything to do, in the sense that why is there a problem to solve? What's the technical difficulty? So <clears throat> as a motivating example, let me just uh, uh, remind you that uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain, the way that uh, transactions, uh, you can abstractly think about uh, the transactions as uh, basically containing uh, signed messages that uh, uh, spell out where the payment is coming from, how much is uh, being paid, and where it goes, okay? Together with a signature that authorizes the payment. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> I've, been, I've been talking about uh, so privacy and uh, blockchains now for several years, and uh, in the past, I really had to uh, sort of make a case for uh, why putting a uh, payment in the clear in the, in the blockchain should worry you. Now I hear sort of some people are uh, 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 laughing. Is, so let's, let's try to go through and understand why uh, uh, we should worry about putting uh, payments in the clear in the blockchain, okay? So first it should be clear that payment history reveals a lot of information, right? So it can reveal uh, uh, medical information. So an insurance company could use uh, sort of the history of your payments uh, to sort of increase your premium. So for example, if you, you know, pay, I don't know, an oncologist, then maybe you know, you're sick with cancer, uh, or even deny coverage. Uh, also, your history of payments actually reveal uh, your kind of location. So there's also a question of you know, personal safety. Uh, so if you're buying coffee in a particular uh, city, probably you're there, right? Uh, and also, it contains a wealth of uh, private information if you're running a business, right? And not by chance, this is one of the reasons that the banking industry, industry is highly regulated. So they are managing, they see uh, all of your uh, uh, private inf financial information and they store it on their servers and they have to be careful with that. And uh, if they mess it up, they will uh, be fined very dearly by the government. Okay, so that's why it is highly regulated. So. Now, in Bitcoin, uh, I was slightly being unfair that you, you don't actually post your payments together with your first and last name uh, of uh, when you send a payment. You actually have an address, okay? So it's just a string. It's a cryptographic public key. And you spell out the cryptographic public key that sends the payment and the cryptographic public key that is supposed to receive the payment, okay? So it's not quite names. Those are just addresses. And indeed, this is uh, the kind of uh, the uh, uh, perspective, or rather the reason for why um, now, 10 years ago, when Bitcoin started, it was uh, regarded as uh, a, an anonymous payment system, right? There's no names. There's just this uh, payments being sent between the cryptographic public keys. Yeah, they're just addresses. Uh, but first and foremost, they're known with everybody you interact with, right? So if you sort of at a, are a point of sale, uh, at the very least, you know the um, address of the uh, merchant that you're interacting with. I mean, that's the point, right? You're getting something in return for the payment. And also, in many realistic scenarios, the merchant themselves gets to learn uh, 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 you know, the payment, that the, the, the tying uh, the fact that uh, you are sending the payment because they're sending you some good or like you know, some service in return, right? After all, in many cases, you want to use payments to achieve some outcome in the physical world, right? So at some point, there is some connection between uh, addresses and uh, physical identities. And these addresses are just sitting out there on the blockchain that you can actually just point your browser to and like read it, okay? And it can be really analyzed by anybody. And one way you can conceptualize this information that is sitting on the uh, blockchain, you can think about it as a transaction graph that over time, sort of you have this uh, cash flow that moves between different addresses, right? And it 
depending on what happens with payments, they will have different structures. Another way to say that is that this transaction graph carries information about sort of payments, right? Uh, there has been several uh, academic studies that say that uh, it's actually not that hard to take this transaction graph, correlate it with some side information, and basically turn these uh, um, sort of virtual cryptographic keys into names of actual sort of physical people, okay? And let me just highlight, <clears throat> and you might be thinking, wait, isn't de-anonymizing good? Uh, so for example, you might have read that uh, the FBI several years ago used <laughs> what you could call blockchain forensics, which is basically reading very carefully what's in the blockchain to actually track down people that were running a, a, a markets for illicit uh, goods like uh, drugs and weapons and uh, a, a, you know, figure out who they are and you know, bring them to, to justice, okay? And in fact, there are private companies out there, for example, Chainalysis and Elliptic, that provide services uh, to third parties to uh, sort of kind of uh, provide whitelists or blacklists of uh, addresses. So uh, these companies might spend time trying to understand the blockchain and say, look, this address has been involved in what are likely illicit activities, so maybe you don't want to accept payments from this address, okay? So it's kind of trying to uh, um, provide um, kind of de-risking services for merchants, right? Yeah, but blockchain analysis is also dangerous. So here's, for example, the first page of a, um, of a court case. Uh, this was actually two years ago, where the, in, the IRS uh, sent a subpoena to Coinbase. Coinbase is the largest uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchange in the United States. It has over 20 million customers. And the IRS uh, asked Coinbase to reveal the identities and the corresponding uh, cryptographic keys for all of Coinbase's customers, okay? Why? Because uh, the IRS was, uh, had this uh, a, a sort of antiquated uh, opinion that sort of everybody that's using cryptocurrencies is also uh, uh, um, sort of involved in illicit activities. So Coinbase went to court and uh, uh, arguing that this was, uh, was a called uh, sort of John Doe summons uh, where sort of there was no, uh, no credible uh, 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 case that uh, the IRS could make that every single of the customers of Coinbase would be involved in these activities. And they tried to argue that, look, you know, please tell me which customers you think might be involved. I'll give you those addresses, right? That would be a more uh, a reasonable thing to do. What in the end happened, some, some sort of, uh, a, um, so there was a court proceedings. In the end, they only allowed 10,000 uh, uh, account holders to, to be handed over to the government, okay? And you know, my opinion is that uh, um, probably this is still a large number. And actually, what's uh, um, very worrisome here is that of these 10,000 people, oh yeah, let's say even some of them, maybe they were involved in some illicit activities, okay? But and say that it may be the answer to those crimes at this point. But now the government actually has the cryptographic keys of these people and can actually track them into the future indefinitely, okay? So this power of tracking on the blockchain is incredibly a, a, a sort of a, a really out of control, okay? Sort of it's a piece of information as it's sitting out there and sort of the amount of information that you know, know about the transaction graph only increases monotonically with time. And the more and more you kind of de-anonymize, the more it helps you de-anonymize other addresses, okay? And there's no way to kind of escape <laughs> de-anonymization. So as basically cryptocurrency moves away from first movers and maybe also criminals into the mainstream, okay? Uh, having a um, sort of private information sitting out there merely a, a, in the form of cryptographic keys is very problematic because the moment somebody gets a hold of your cryptographic key, suddenly they can look at your past and future uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, working from there. So privacy is actually a big problem in this respect. Wait, feel free to stop when you have questions. Are there questions so far? I, I have a yes. So it doesn't seem like it's any worse than the system now, where I give my name and my credit card number. Great yeah. question, okay. So right now, uh, you have presumably a bank, right, where you hold your money. And the bank uh, knows who you are and knows exactly what you're doing. But it's only the bank that knows, okay. Uh, well, and you know, whoever they have business relationships. So but the point is not, it's not arbitrary people anywhere. So right now, in the, uh, in the case of Bitcoin, like you could pull out your laptop, point your browser to the, any sort of so-called blockchain explorers, and anybody can 
you know, even download tools. There actually there are open source tools you can download the developer academics to conduct a, a blockchain analysis. And anybody can actually learn information about you. Whereas right now, it's only the bank and whatever you know, third party relationships it has. So it's very different in this respect. So one of my. Uh, so they uh, can find out your transactions. Yeah, they can find your transactions. And uh, sort of, uh, one of my uh, 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 colleagues, Ian Myers, has, a, uh, 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 I think, a, a lovely quote that says Bitcoin is like uh, Twitter for your bank account. So it's some, every event is uh, kind of publicly broadcast, <laughs> surely without identities, but you know, <laughs> soon enough it will be attached to it. Good point. And of course, you know, we're all fine with revealing our financial identities to you know, a particular third party, the bank, who must follow the law, must uh, sort of manage our uh, privacy information according to some uh, you know, well-specified uh, uh, regulations and so on. OK. So <clears throat> one can, of course, try to obfuscate history. Uh, you know, just use a new address for each payment. Maybe we'll all get together and sort of mix our money and basically sort of use traditional money laundering techniques to protect our own privacy. <clears throat> it seems harder to analyze. But the point is that this is not really an effective uh, mitigation, OK? So uh, of course, it will make it harder maybe for a human to eyeball what's happening. But you know, algorithms are very good at, 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 at extracting bad patterns. So uh, it's the moment you apply some uh, minimal sort of uh, heuristics and machine learning to this type of information, uh, you know, it will be defeated. And really, the problem here is that at, fundamentally, uh, in Bitcoin, and more, more generally, any system where you're recording your uh, uh, transaction details in a clear text, this history is publicly stored forever. And the methods of analysis only get better. Okay? And the, the more successful the system is, the more it interacts with the physical world, and the more you can correlate information and anonymize. Okay, so it's really like a problem. Okay, um, separately, if you actually don't care about privacy, some people actually really don't, and I don't understand why, but uh, um, <clears throat> there are economic motivations to care about uh, what you store on the blockchain, and it has to do with uh, something called fungibility. The point is that <clears throat> at least the way that uh, we set up a, 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 so a lot of the economy is set up today is that we have uh, you know, things like cash or you know, currencies, and the point is that I can pay you in any, I can pull out of my wallet you know, different types of bills. And as long as they add up <coughs> to the correct amount, I can just pay you with those. And you shouldn't care you know, exactly which bills I pull out of my pocket. However, you know, Bitcoin is not fungible because in this, you can see for every sort of payment that I send you, you can see the pedigree, you can see the history of what led to that particular coin that now is about to make its journey to you. And you may have some opinions about uh, whether you like or not the history of this particular coin. So to some extent, the, the value of a coin is ill-defined because different people may value the same coin differently simply because they might disagree on uh, whether they like or not like its history. The same person could value different coins differently. And more generally, coins that have shorter history are more valuable because they're less likely to uh, uh, sort of have opinionated people uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 overvalue or undervalue them. And actually, uh, it's so bad that today, already, uh, sort of fresh Bitcoins are more valuable than old Bitcoins, just because of this reason. Okay? And there are also third party services that will use blockchain analysis tools to validate whether coins have a good history. And those are come at a premium. Okay? So now, the notion of value is to some extent centralized, okay? and because it's ill defined. So, what do you mean that new coins are more valuable? You get more money? In fiat? Yeah, so like if you want to buy a, like a newly minted coin, yeah. uh, you know, they will sell it to you at a, at, at a, prim, at a higher price. Why? Because if you have another coin that has a longer history, then it, you, the, your ability to spend it is impaired. So when you're trying to buy, I don't know, you know the famous example of buying pizza with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? you might be charged more Bitcoins if you're, you plan to use uh, uh, Bitcoins with longer history, because then the merchant has the liability of having sort of old Bitcoins that in the future may be revealed to be uh, in, involved in illicit activities, and, may, and therefore they might lose part of their value. So it's kind of a risk mitigation, OK? So now, in cash, of course, we have serial numbers. And so they are uniquely identified. It's not like they're literally fungible in, uh, down to the you know, last point. But the point is that we don't know their history. That's a feature. Okay. 
So this is a complete, this really has, put, has nothing to do with privacy, it's just on economic terms, what does it mean for something to be fungible? Some of privacy you know, comes in and affects it. Okay, good questions. All right, so I think there is some problem to solve. And if it's so, if it's so important, why, why isn't it solved? So here is what we have. And you know, at some point, you know, I receive some money, and later on, I want to spend it, right? And when I spend it, other people need to check that I have this money to spend. How do people know it? Because they can go back in history and check that I received it. And in the interim, I didn't spend it. Therefore, I have it. OK? So <clears throat> you might wonder, OK, so whenever we have some private information, sort of the, the uh, Usually, the quick solution is to just encrypt the, the relevant uh, 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 sort of sensitive information and be done with it. Why don't we just encrypt the payment details and then post them on the blockchain? So here, how it would look like we have transactions that are now encrypted. Okay, so instead of having the cryptographic key of the sender, the cryptographic key of the uh, uh, receiver and the amount, all these pieces are encrypted and then posted on the blockchain. What's the problem then? Sorry. What, what key do you use? Well, I can, I can encrypt under you know, the, the sender's uh, public key, for example, so that they can decrypt. Uh, but then there's another problem, yes? If it's encrypted, you can't decipher the information to whether it's valid. Right, so I can't tell anymore whether a particular payment is valid or not. So somehow, like, <clears throat> privacy and integrity are at odds, because why does Bitcoin achieve a payment system? Because it achieves this notion of consensus. So we can agree on the events that happened. So, I cannot double spend because when I do double spend, there is a sort of undeniable trace that I did so very explicitly so in clear text in the blockchain. Okay? Somehow the fact that the information is literally there is important for currency to mean anything. Okay? As this kind of unit, these tokens that can be sort of, they're, they're digital, but they're kind of at any moment in time, they're owned by only one person. Right? Cannot be double spent. Um, so, yeah, it's just not clear what to do. So you're saying that in order to, to verify that it hasn't been double spent, you have to know who the identity of the person is. Right, because uh, here, for, let's take this uh, particular example. So Bob wants to pay Eve three. Why, who sh who should be, why the, can he do that? Well, because at some point he received three, and I can go and check that this transaction didn't uh, involve uh, Bob spending three. This one didn't, this one didn't, this one th didn't. If I did it this way, I would see a bunch of junk encrypted junk, or rather encrypted information that looks like junk, and I can't decide really w w when I decrypt this information because it was sent to me whether I, I received a payment that is valid or whether in the meantime it was spent somewhere else. <clears throat> okay, so what I want to do in the, I guess, I think remaining 20 minutes is I want to uh, tell you how one resolves this tension, okay? So the idea here is that we're going to be using somehow zero-knowledge proofs. And by now today, there is a number of uh, uh, um, protocols that you could uh, uh, go about to try to uh, solve this problem. The one I will explain today uh, is called the zero-cache protocol, something that I uh, worked on with uh, my colleagues uh, um, sort of when I was a, a student back at MIT. And <clears throat> this is a cryptographic protocol that achieves a ledger-based currency uh, that is privacy preserving. By the way, when I say ledger based, it doesn't really matter whether it's based on a proof of work, or on a proof of stake, or Algorand. All I'm really using is the fact that there is some ledger somewhere. So what I'm discussing is, for the most part, orthogonal to the way that we achieve agreement on the sequence of events on the blockchain. And by privacy preserving, I mean that we'll be able, anybody will be able to post payment transactions that contain something in them that on the one hand, they can be validated for you know, being good payments, but at the same time, they provably hide the payment sender, receiver, and amount, okay? which are, in this case, the pieces of information I was trying to hide. Uh, as a bonus, uh, it actually happens that uh, this cryptographic solution is rather efficient, and uh, uh, you know, these transactions take just a few seconds to produce. They're very small and uh, very easy to verify. So let's try to think of the very basic intuition at high level, what it is that I'm trying to do. So intuitively, we are going to encrypt a, a, a information. And by the end of the day, like, we can't put the information there because when we put it, then we've lost. So 
We can't put it there. So let's say that we encrypt it. Now, the thing that was missing was a way for third parties not involved in a particular transaction to establish whether the payment was valid or not. Notice that establishing whether a payment is valid or not, a method to do that is to look at the payment details. But as a third party, you don't actually care about the payment details. You just care about validating the payment. So what we're going to do is we're going to attach a proof of validity of the payment okay, to each transaction. Okay, so encrypted payments and proof of validity. Encrypted, encrypted payment details, proof of validity. So the way it would look like is when Alice produces her transaction, she's going to say, hey, I'm going to publish three ciphertexts. They contain the encryptions of a sender address, a receiver address, and a transfer amount. Transfer amount. Moreover, the amount transferred has not been double spent. And here's a cryptographic proof that all of this is true. Okay. Now, for this to make sense, we need to understand what kind of cryptographic proofs are we going to use here. Okay. So it's going to be some method that convinces third parties of uh, this statement. And then, what exactly are we proving? In a sense that it's just English. Okay. It's just a few sentences, right? Uh, but at some point, there's going to be you know some specific mathematical statement about the payment that I need to prove to others. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about that. So first, in terms of what kind of cryptographic proof? Well, first there has to be a proof. What does a proof mean? It means that I ought to be able to produce valid looking proofs for true statements and I should not be able to produce valid looking proofs for statements that are not true. So for example, if I have indeed already spent my money, I should not be able to produce a transaction that spends that money again and the proof is valid. Okay. Uh, these are proofs I need to be able to write down and include in a block. Uh, this seems like, uh, uh, why would you worry about it? Well, as cryptographers, we think all the time about interactive proofs. And so, in this case, it's important I'm able to write it down. And crucially, importance here, the, the privacy property will come from a notion called zero knowledge that uh, uh, Shafi and Silvio introduced uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, <clears throat> that is, it will make sure that this cryptographic proof can be validated Using, I mean, the cryptographic proof contains information that, that, on the one hand, allows for validating the payment, but does not reveal the payment details. Otherwise, here's a proof for validating the payment. I give you the decryption key, you, de you decrypt the ciphertext, and you check it yourself, right? So that's a valid way of providing the proof, right? But that's not what we're going to do. There's going to be some indirect method that still convinces you that the underlying plain text satisfies some nice property, yet the way that I'm convincing you has this zero knowledge property that doesn't leak information about the uh, plain text underneath. There are other properties, and the only reason why I'm mentioning them is for in this talk is that you may have heard of this acronym, ZK SNARK. In fact, we had three days of workshops at the Berkeley Marina on this uh, a, a, a primitive. That's where these things come from. But uh, for today, for this talk, the only thing that matters really is just this uh, zero knowledge property. I could spend an entire talk and more about uh, this primitive, but what I want to focus on today is how we use it, okay? I want to tell you about, given such a magical object of a zero-knowledge proof, how do we actually go about producing privacy-preserving payments? Okay, so we're going to take this as a black box for now, okay? The questions, because we're not going to talk about this proof again. Maybe, maybe yes. not just on that, but I was thinking, okay, now we obfuscate the ledger. But I can see, okay, I, I, for me, for our address, it's not easy to look at the ledger and see how, how I can track everyone. But what I would do, given that in practice there is something like Coinbase, who is collecting anyway secret keys of everyone, and knows what is happening on the ledger, they are able to deobfuscate the ledger. An attacker can go anyway to Coinbase, steal the keys, and learn everything, no? So we well, are putting <clears throat> even more pressure on Coinbase. If we're going to give the secret keys to the adversary, there's nothing I can do, right? So, uh, when. At some point, if I, I have to distinguish myself, me, honest person, against everybody else. Typically, this is a cryptographic secret. So I have to make sure that I manage my own secrets properly. If I entrust Coinbase with my own secrets, I'm entrusting them with uh, a, my privacy and indeed my integrity. So if somebody enters their database and steals a, my secrets because I gave them to Coinbase, at this point, there is no logical difference between me and adversary. And in particular, they can do whatever yeah, I could. So what's the point? If in practice, everyone is I using Coinbase. What's no, point? You should not be using Coinbase. <laughs> <laughs> so look, look let's, let's take a step back. So managing your own secrets is difficult. OK, custody of secrets is really hard. OK, and uh, as we go forward with the technolo blockchain technology, 
it is important as individual users and as an industry to come up with best practices for secrets. In particular, uh, I think one of the exciting developments around uh, uh, central, centralized exchanges is some of them are starting to explore so-called non-custodial services, where they're still providing to you marketplaces where you can exchange tokens, but you still retain custody of your own secrets. Okay? Um, Ali, but I mean, honestly, uh, most of our stuff is sort of centralized. My Gmail is centralized, my Dropbox is centralized. I mean, this is convenient and people do do that. Even if I can't trace it here, you know, if I send money to you, I'll be on my WhatsApp, I'll say, oh, did you get the money? You know, or whatever, you know, the, it, have you seen it on the blockchain? Like, you know, there are, there are going to be so many side channels to... Uh, uh, Okay, but there's different things here. So one is if you give your secrets to Coinbase, Coinbase, you know, will track you. Fine, but it's not the third parties. Oh, what if they attack Coinbase? Okay, fine, but you know, that, that's equivalent to giving your secrets to somebody else. But the point is that short of giving your secrets to somebody else, the blockchain itself doesn't contain information. So I don't understand kind of the, the, the question in the sense that there's not, there's even, even for integrity, this has nothing to do with privacy, by the way. It, we're discussing equally privacy and uh, adversaries spending your money without your consent. So that's the kind of orthogonal point to, to see. Yes, uh, Remco. It, it does actually um, beg for a slightly stronger property where the receiver cannot know where he received the money from. Let's say the receiver is a Coinbase account which is fully compromised, and I'm still trying to preserve my... Yeah. It is possible to achieve that you don't know where money comes from. I will not hi highlight that today. Uh, but it's yeah. tough to do that when you're using Coinbase because you want it to be in your account. I mean, you can send the money and they don't know where it came from. <laughs> Then you lose it, right? So uh, what I want to say is that sort of, I think this discussion is more about custody rather than privacy, in a sense that both uh, authorizing your payments and your own privacy is eventually rooted in some secret that distinguishes you with, from everybody else, right? And you know, whoever controls your secrets, whether it is you or you and a, some third party you trust, you know, that's your attack surface, right? And uh, that's the way it is, yes. So it's uh, tax day on Monday, so let me ask a tax question. So yeah, tax question, tax, <laughs> tax so question. Basically, so how would I like look okay, if you hold this asset in US, right? You are you are obliged to actually report to the IRS or whatever. What do you think about the future of IRS or all those US governments going to go with this technology? Or? The tax system in the United States is honor based. Uh, well, but it is, and that's how it is. So you know, you're, it is the responsibility of reporting your uh, tax, uh, your financial dealings lies on you, uh, and uh, if you don't, that you, you are in, in the violation of the law. And uh, uh, you know whether the, the 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 government finds you or not, that's their problem. That's sort of it, the, the responsibility lies is on their you. Their problem in yeah. the government problem or our problem? Not the government problem, right? But it already is. <laughs> so, but you know, I'm not going to discuss tax considerations. <laughs> 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 the, 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 these particular considerations have little to do with uh, uh, you know if you have a stack. <laughs> Let's put it like this: you know, if you if you run uh, uh, you know like a, a, an ice cream truck. Uh, you know, in a suburban uh, uh, city, and you make your money on ice creams, and you don't report your, you know, so your your cash transactions to the government. Uh, you know, you're in violation of the law yeah, equally. It's a small business, but this could go big, right? <laughs> ice cream trucks are really great business. You should. Try. <laughs> so, so, you don't know how many hungry kids there are. So, so, so <clears throat> what is what exactly the statement we're we going to prove with uh, zero knowledge? Okay. So before we only had uh, um, um, it's an English sentence, okay? So, and this is actually where the protocol design comes up, okay? So uh, I want to spend how much? I have ten minutes, or I want to spend ten minutes telling you the first few steps of the protocol, okay? How we go about setting up some data structures that are reasoning about the blockchain, and so these are going to be like some data structures that can prove things about, okay? So I'm going to do it in a so cryptographic fashion. We're going to start with something that is completely broken and makes no sense. We're going to patch it up piece by piece until we achieve you know, some, some design. It's actually going to be, I think, rather simple. So my view of the blockchain is going to, I'm going to so the template zero, I'm going to have several slides laid out in similar ways. So let me tell you kind of what the template is. I'm going to always have the blockchain at the top. Different colors will denote different types of transactions. We're going to have some notion of what coin means down on the left. Right now it's empty because we haven't started. So let's start. So let's have a very stupid notion of a coin. It's just a random number. Let's call it a serial number. The way you create a coin is you declare to the world, here I have created a coin with this number. The way you spend a coin 
is you declare to the world, I'm spending that coin with this serial number. Okay? Is it clear? It could be confusing because it's almost, you know, to, you know, because I'm starting with a, 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 a very basic construction as well, almost has no problems. I want to say that the one thing, so, and what's going to happen is that the events is going to have, you know, somebody's going to mint a coin, somebody else is going to mint another coin, at some point somebody's going to spend it. And what's the important thing here that I want you to notice, notice is that you cannot spend a coin unless it was minted at some point in the past. Okay, somehow this serial number uniquely defined this coin, and you cannot, crucially, you cannot double spend, because if you try to broadcast twice a spend event with the same serial number, you know, the system will tell you no. Well, that's pretty, pretty much the only good thing in this design. Uh, <clears throat> first, kind of by design, spend is linkable to the mint, okay? That's how you see that it's double spent. Also, anybody can spend. In fact, I, I, I send a mint transaction and somebody else can spend it for me because they just saw the serial number, okay? In particular, there are no secrets here, so there's no cryptography. But why don't you just to sink in this notion of serial number, okay? Serial number uniquely tied to a coin. Okay. Let's improve on this. Now we're going to have a different coin. The serial number, okay, is going to be secret. And we're going to commit to it to create a so-called coin commitment. So now when I create the coin, I only publish the coin commitment. I'm saying, hey world, I have created a coin with some serial number. And I'm not telling you right now what it is. Later, when I spend it, I'm telling you, by the way, here's a serial number with a commitment randomness that corresponds to the commitment that I had before. So the way now things look like is this, right? Now, when I see a spend transaction here, I can check that it corresponds, oh, it doesn't correspond to this one. Oh, but it looks to this, it corresponds to this one, so it's fine, I can spend it. I cannot spend it again because the same serial number would show up. So we cannot double spend. So you have but to check all the serial numbers to see that it has, hasn't showed up. Yes, I have to check all the serial numbers that haven't showed up. <clears throat> also that, in the previous one. But is that inherently necessary? It's not necessary, it can be, uh, yeah. The crucial thing that has happened here is that because I'm not revealing the serial number at minting, you cannot spend my coin, okay? Because you don't know the serial number. I'm only telling you the coin commitment. And a commitment, you know, hides information, okay? So what's bad is that we, <laughs> we set out to prevent linking, we're still, things are linkable, okay? So we have to kind of go beyond this. So <clears throat> here's where we're gonna start using a zero knowledge proof for doing something basic. The, the data structure for the coin has not changed. It continues to be a commitment to a random serial number. Minting also hasn't changed. I publish a commitment to the coin when I want to mint it. By the way, I'm assuming that there is some monetary policy around it. You know, why can you mint a coin? Well, probably because you know, you're consuming some other resource somewhere else. So there is some way to control uh, when you can mint, right? So you're kind of converting some other resource into this one. Now spending, I'm going to reveal the serial number like before, but instead of giving you the full information about my commitment, like the commitment information that then would tell you which commitment I was referring to in the past, I am going to produce a serial number, I'm going to produce a proof that is zero knowledge that attests to two things. First, there exists a commitment in the list of prior commitments that corresponds to the serial number that I'm revealing right now. Okay, so I'm saying, here's, here's the proof, and here's the serial number, and I'm telling you, I'm proving to you in zero knowledge that I know some commitment that is in the list of all serial numbers, of the con commitments that have appeared so far, and one of them, I'm not telling you which one, is such that I can put in some random string and I will get that commitment for the serial number that I'm revealing, okay? It's some sort of set membership. I'm, pr I'm proving to you that the coin whose serial number I'm revealing belongs to the set of all coin commitments so far, but I'm not telling you which. So what's good here is that we still cannot double spend because we're revealing serial numbers. People still cannot spend my coins because I have the secrets and other people don't. But now crucially, spend and mint are unlinkable. Okay, that's very important. Whenever I see a spend, all I see is just some random number and a proof that tells me that I, somebody has spent some coin that was created in the past. Are you comfortable with this? 
I only have you know, two more slides, and then we're going to fix a few more things. But you know, this is the first place where we're using a zero knowledge proof. Is it clear? Sorry. Yes. Uh, in the previous slide, only R is revealed, right? So you, how, do you, how do you still link that back to the main? Well, if I w in the previous slide, because I was revealing just R, what you can do together with the serial number is you compute forward the commitment, oh. and you get the actual coin commitment, and you just literally check in the list. So you're yes. also assuming that the serial numbers are chosen randomly, because you could do the ser same serial number with different R, right? Yeah, you could a well, a commitment uh, is a commitment, because you cannot change what's inside it, right? right. So. If you could, then we, had a, we would have had a problem even before. So is R random, or what is it? You can think about R as random, and uh, it's important it is random, but what's more important is that the serial number is uh, a... So, so what I was just saying is you could have two coins with the same serial number. Mm -hmm. That would not be a commitment, because if, if you could do that, then uh, it, it would violate sort of... I didn't really linger too much on commitment, but sort of you think of commitment as you know you put uh, some information in a in a box and you open the box later, but you cannot change the information in the meantime. So Ali, I think what's missing is uh, yeah. with, with this example, one-time spends are not linkable to anything. But what you really wanted is that the spend itself means something new, and then it creates these graphs. So That's what we're going to do next. Right. So was that was that your question or? No. Yeah. But I think that's what everybody's asking. What's yeah, yeah, so what's about linking the spend to a mint? It's a one-time mint. Yeah. Not, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not, so right now, we don't have a payment system of any sort. We're just playing with tokens. <laughs> we're putting them in an anonymity pool. We're pulling them out later. And it's a nice game. <laughs> but we're not really achieving anything. So right now, in particular, notice that there is no notion of address right now. Okay, So to start transacting, we need to introduce notions of address. So. <clears throat> Oh, wait, let me just, I have one uh, before the, the address slide, which is next one, I have the, the value slide. So let me introduce values, hopefully that will make you, is that there's nothing much that's happening here. I'm introducing a value, so when you coin, when you, when you mint, when you create a coin commitment, it has a value tied to it, okay? And when you're minting, you tell the world which value, how much value you're, you're minting, because it, you know, again, it's coming from some other resource. When you're spending, you prove the same thing. You prove that uh, the coin commitment was a list of prior commitments. You prove that uh, everything you have in mind is well formed. And that's how it works. Are you comfortable? I've just added denominations, OK? I, I split it in two slides because it's easier to think about. All right, so we're only really, we're only hiding the sender. Right now, if you're trying to send money to the receiver, you pull it out of the anonymity pool, and then you actually have to send it you know, uh, uh, to the receiver. So how are we going to do that? So now we're going to introduce the notion of payment address. And this is the other, the second uh, idea of this protocol. How are we going to tie coins with identities? <coughs> so we are going to have a public key committed to in the coin commitment. And then there's another quantity here, row. We call it the serial number seed. And it's used to produce the serial number keyed on a secret key. So you have some hash function that hashes together your serial number seed and the secret key to produce the serial number. Okay? And the way that and the public key and secret key pair is related in some way, it doesn't really matter how, how it's related, it's just some public and secret key pair. The new thing that happened is that coin commitment is owned by a particular public key and the serial number depends on the secret key. This is an important asymmetry. We're gonna see that now. Okay? So as before, I mean like before, when I spend, I say that I know all the secret information about the serial number that I'm revealing. The coin commitment is in the prior list. All the things I'm, that I'm ask, ask, talking about this data structure are correct. And now I have to prove that the serial number, before it was, it was appearing just here, right? Now I'm moving the serial number here and making depend on the secret key, okay? Why would that be the case? By the way, I'm still not paying anybody. I'm just introducing data structure. Does anybody have an intuition for why the, uh, the serial number should depend on the secret key, not the public key? Okay. Intuitively, I want to try to separate. When I pay somebody, I'm going to have to create their coins, right? And I shouldn't be able to predict when they spend their own coins, OK? So 
Okay, I haven't really used addresses here. So here's the last slide, direct payments. So this is the, this is the protocol, okay? So when I spend, I don't want to just create, I don't just want to burn my coin. I want to create another coin at the same time as I burn my own coin, okay? And the proof is not gonna say, oh, I burned my coin and I could do, the, could do that because I never burned it before. Through burning it, I have released some value that I can imbue another coin with, okay? And that's, I'm gonna use your public key. I'm gonna create a new coin under your name, okay? And then because the serial number of this other coin depends on your secret key, I don't know when you're gonna spend it, okay? So, <clears throat> So this is just the last slide. I'm going to go through it very slowly. And this is just basically the key idea of how you get uh, direct payments. I'm going to provide a zero-knowledge proof that says I know a bunch of secrets. Which secrets? Well, first I need to talk about secrets for my coin, the coin A. I know my coin commitment in the past, three days ago. It has a certain value, which now I'm hiding even. A bunch of stuff related to the coin commitment. And then my own public key and my own secret key. Here's what I'm proving about my coin. I've minted it. It's well formed. I actually own it. I have to prove that I own it, by the way. Right? Notice here I'm saying that I have the secret key for the public key that is inside the coin that I'm talking about. Okay? And I'm revealing the serial number correctly. I also have to uh, prove that I know information about a new coin that I'm creating. It has a coin commitment, which, by the way, I'm revealing right now, a value that I'm also not revealing. And you know, I'm creating, I need to prove to you that I'm creating it in a well-formed way. And last but not least, the value is the same. OK? So in this way, when you see this transaction, you know that all of these things happen in my head. OK? And I'm certifying it to you using this proof. OK? So, uh, I think all I really wanted today was just to get to uh, this slide because it's the main idea. And what I wanted to, uh, uh, um, to show you is that we had an initial intuition, which was I'm going to use a knowledge proof that I publish all these ciphertexts, and underneath the ciphertext there is a valid payment. What we did from that high level intuition to here is we turned that into specific data structures or statements about secrets. Okay? That are sort of set up so that we have this notion of a coin, and we're burning coins and creating coins, preserving value in between, OK? And each time that now you mint and you spend, you mint and you spend, when you see a spend, you have no idea what's going on. You're just seeing some random value, a, coin for a, a commitment for some new coin. You have no idea information about it. And all you know is that value was preserved. It's all, oh, but that's like a coin to another coin. Can I do two coins to two coins? Sure. It's an easy generalization of that. So you can split coins. You can merge coins, right? But I still don't see yeah. how you make sure that it's not double spend. So why can't you do this to coin C? Is it because you have to go through the entire history of the blockchains to check? What you're asking about the serial numbers. Yes. Okay. Uh, what you can do is that I didn't put here is you can also prove that the serial number that you're revealing is not in the list of all serial numbers. Okay, so this is also non-containment. You could do that as well. In practice, this is actually not what you do anyways, because the list of serial numbers, you're just, you can index it, and you can just uh, quickly check whether it appears that or not. But from a theoretical perspective, it's totally reasonable to say, let me let the zero knowledge proof not only reason about the list of all coin commitments with an inclusion statement, but the list of all serial numbers with an exclusion statement. But because the other way, you, if, if you just have index it, then you would know. You no, would but uh, you're just. Uh, you have the list of all prior coins. Now you're spending some other one. All you have to check is that it's not there. And so provided that you're not double spending. So it's not equality for the Exactly. Secrets. It's not equality. Exactly. Well, you have to do it for the, for the, for the length of history. Yes. Okay. And, but you can put it in the. Well, you don't have to do it for the length of history because you have this non-exclusion. But in right. practice, you do it for the length of history. Yes, and from a privacy perspective, it's fine because what are all these things? All the pri other coins that were spent in the past with some serial number, now you get some other serial number. You add it in, and uh, you make sure it wasn't there. And, yeah. But the size of the statement goes exponentially if you do non-exclusion, right? I mean, right now it's just Merkle tree and log sort of size. The size of the proof statement. Non-exclusion in Merkle trees works. 
But you have to do for every, right? I mean, like, uh, you have to show that it's not any of these serial numbers. You can set up Merkle trees with non-exclusion proofs. So, yeah. yeah. Good I haven't talked about this in Todix here. So like, you don't actually talk about the entire list. You use Merkle trees to, to kind of have logarithmic dependence. All right, so I think I'm going to uh, stop here and maybe take any uh, questions. But uh, uh, that's, I just wanted to communicate the, the, the core ideas of the protocol. Short break, 10 minutes, then there'll be Tom Vidic's talk, and then lunch. Yeah. What parts of this break in a post-quantum world? So, good question. So, there are two levels at which you can try to think. So, the question was, uh, 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 what is post-quantum about this protocol? So, when you think about a the protocol, there are two layers at which you can try to think about uh, a quantum adversary trying to break. One is the building blocks themselves. You know, is the commitment scheme post-quantum secure to begin with? Because if it's not, then never mind what you're doing with the protocol. Separately, you can say, well, let's assume that each of the building blocks, the commitment scheme, the zero knowledge proof, the pseudonym function, are post quantum secure on their own. Now I combine them in a particular protocol. Do you have a reduction that is secure against quantum adversaries? Now, let me answer the first question. So, <clears throat> in terms of concrete practical primitives today, uh, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some of, the, some of the primitives that we're using, for example, pseudonym functions, are plausibly post-quantum because they're just things like SHA-256. Other things like zero-knowledge proofs, they're currently based on discrete logarithm, uh, on, the, on the hardness with discrete logarithms. So that, that would not be. But you could drop in and replace some zero-knowledge proof that is post-quantum. As for the protocol itself, I haven't tried to do uh, the analysis. It's an interesting question to say, give me a post-quantum PRF, post-quantum commitment scheme, blah, blah. Can you get a post-quantum a payment protocol. I think it's a, it's a good question. I, I don't see a priori what could go wrong, but quantum is weird, and, and so there are many settings where sort of you don't have a direct port of reductions. Okay, so break. Thank you. Okay.